In this episode of the High Tech and Neuro Disorders podcast from undergrad students at UCLA, host Jacob and Hugo interview world-renowned neurosurgeon, Dr. Daniel Kelly, director and one of the founders of Pacific Neuroscience Institute. They run the gamut of topics from tips and tricks of being a doctor and neurosurgeon to brain and pituitary surgery to the expansion of P&I into the study of psychedelic assisted clinical trials for many kinds of mental health and behavioral disorders. And now a message from our sponsor. The Think Neuro podcast is brought to you by Pacific Neuroscience Institute Foundation, a nonprofit 501c3 organization. If you're inspired by what you hear and wish to support our mission of education through innovation, please visit pacificneuro.org slash foundation. everybody and welcome to this episode of the hand podcast today we're interviewing dr daniel kelly he's a neurosurgeon who focuses on brain tumors pituitary disorders as well as psychedelic therapy dr kelly went to claremont mckenna college then georgetown university for medicine later going to george washington university for neurosurgery he's completed thousands of surgeries for pituitary and neural issues and is someone to look up to for us undergraduates welcome to the hand podcast dr kelly hi hugo thanks for having me of course. So for our first question, starting from when you were an undergrad or possibly even before that, can you give us a brief history of your journey of becoming a highly accomplished neurosurgeon? Sure. Well, it wasn't well planned out, but it did, it did come about. Eventually, I figured, figured my way forward. I, I had a, a lot of interest just in, in high school in the biological sciences. And um, when I went to Claremont, um, I pursued that. They had, they had a great biology program there. And um, initially, I was actually very interested in marine biology. And um, I realized after you know, talking to my professors and looking into it that I would have to do probably a PhD in that. And it was pretty narrow and focused. And um, uh, then I started to think about medicine. And... The, the nice thing about medical school is it's in a way there's so many opportunities in medicine, as you know, that it's almost like postponing a decision that you'll be able to find something in medicine that you'll like, whether it's, you know, dermatology, cardiology, um, orthopedics, neurosurgery, neurology. So I had a, I had a, a real inkling. I would do something in the neurosciences, but, um, medicine seemed like the way to go. Um, uh, as opposed to doing marine biology. And um, I also got very interested in, um, in my junior and senior year in college in human evolution and the evolution of intelligence. And that, I wrote my senior thesis on that. And that, that kind of led me more into the, into the neurosciences. And so ultimately, when I, got, when I got to med school, I liked a lot of things that I did um, but, but ultimately, I chose um, neurosurgery really because um, I really liked the neuro aspect and I liked the surgical aspect. You know, neurology is a great field, um, but it's a lot of diagnostic work. And neurosurgery is um, you know, it's a lot of hands-on work. The anatomy is beautiful. Um, the, the surgery is gratifying. And I also thought it was a field that was one at the time, you know, 30 years ago, um, and still is a field that's very much growing and can still do a lot, a lot better in a lot of areas. So I knew it would be a field that I would, would not get bored in. And, uh, so that's kind of how I, I made the, made the decision. Uh, I started off being really into marine bio too. So that's an interesting, uh, <laughs> connection there. So speaking of surgery, can you describe your first surgery and over the years, how has your approach to surgeries and just like the way that you see those, it's kind of a problem solving process, I assume. And so how do you like approach that uh, and how has that changed over time? Yeah, I'm not sure I exactly remember my first surgery. It's uh, those early days of training, you know, being an intern and being a resident, 
they're a bit of a blur, but um, I can tell you that the way we treat um, brain tumors now and the way we were treating them back then has changed quite a bit. Um, one of the things that I'm, that I'm very passionate about and myself and our entire group at Pacific Neuroscience have, have really helped, you know, we think push the boundaries on minimally invasive approaches to brain tumors, tumors of the skull base and pituitary tumors. So we specialize in what's called keyhole surgery. So doing things through very, very small openings, often with the use of an endoscope um, to minimize uh, the need to manipulate the brain and the, the surrounding structures, blood vessels, nerves, and to minimize collateral damage to, to the brain. So that, you know, I like to tell patients, we're gonna to try to sneak in and sneak out, remove the tumor so that you, uh, you know, can get back to what you love doing as soon as possible. And, you know, over the years, um, we've, we have perfected a lot of things and we, we are able to treat a lot of tumors through, through the nose, uh, through little incisions in the eyebrow, small incisions behind the ear, obviously depends where the tumors are located. Sometimes we operate through a port. Through it. When we have a tumor in the depths of the brain, we operate through a tube that helps separate the brain and is a, probably a little less destructive than some of the other ways we used to get there. And, you know, with good anesthesia um, and, and refined instrumentation, better endoscopes, navigation, something we call the Doppler probe, which helps, helps us localize blood vessels. All of these things have sort of incrementally allowed us to do more and more minimally invasive surgery. And so now many of our brain tumor patients go home on day one after surgery. They're only in the hospital for 24 hours. At least half of them don't even go to the ICU. Virtually all of our pituitary patients with pituitary tumors that we operate through the nose, they, they almost all go home on day one. And, um, and so we've really compressed the timeline and we, we, we have sort of, you know, achieved and, and created a minimally invasive paradigm for, for brain tumor surgery. So it's changed, it's changed a lot, I would say over the last um, 20 years. Speaking of how surgery has changed, can you describe, I guess, the continued process of like learning as a, as a surgeon, even after you've become a surgeon, new, mm -hmm. new methods are coming out. And also, can you describe what's the process of new procedures coming out? Is it just sort of trial and error or do you, do you experiment or is it given to you? That's a good, those are good questions. So on, you know, continual learning, you know, they have this thing called CME, continuing medical education, and you never stop learning as a doctor. And if you, and uh, as, a, as a human being, hopefully you never stop learning. But um, within medicine, I think it's very important to pay attention to things that are changing, opportunities to change, but also as you're taking care of individual patients of paying attention and acknowledging when things don't go well, whether it's, um, you know, something you did or, or, or the patient's pathology and unexpected event occurs. Um, and we, we have um, a regular conference that we call morbidity and mortality. You may have heard that M and M. And so where we review all of the complications and deaths if they occur and how could we have done better? And that sort of continual uh, self-assessment and this honest discussion with yourself and your colleagues um, is critical to, you know, continuing to advance the care and take the best, the best care of patients. You know, when I was at UCLA, I was at UCLA for 14 years on faculty there um, from 93 to 2007. And that was, you know, a big part of what we do with the, the residency training program. Now what, Pacific Neuroscience Institute, you know, we've had 15 fellows, clinical fellows um, over the last um, almost 15 years. And those fellows are learning these minimally invasive approaches. And we talk about, you know, ways to avoid, avoid errors, avoid complications, optimize out, outcomes. And so um, that, again, this, this sort of self-education and group education of learning from your mistakes is critical to the whole process of, of providing the, the best patient care. And then I think you asked about 
how do we try new things? Like, how do we invent new techniques? Well, so some of the things um, are very subtle variations on an approach. Like, for instance, we, we do a lot of surgery through the eyebrow, okay, to get to brain tumors. So we make an incision in the eyebrow. One of the issues with that operation is it's, it's much better than the big traditional sort of C-shaped incision behind the, your question mark behind the hairline it comes down here. So we can do a lot of things. So a little opening, like about, you know, two by two and a half centimeters. One of the issues with that is patients get, um, they can get numbness of the forehead and their frontalis muscle can be weak and it almost always gets better. But we, we modified that technique by the way we cut through what's called the pericranium. Instead of this arcing cut, we do a more linear cut. A, a little sort of subtle technical modification, which resulted in people, you know, having less of weak forehead and, and a more rapid recovery. That was a technical note. So that, that's, you know, it's not really an experiment. It's something we changed. And over the years, we collected all the data on those patients and we could see a difference. Um, sometimes we'll try a new um, type of microscope or a new endoscope. Like we try go from a 2D endoscope to a 3D endoscope. You know, that's, you can just bring those in. As long as they've gone through the FDA approval process, you can bring those in and see if they, they help, you know. Um, but the other thing that we do is we, my partner, Dr. Barkadarian, neurosurgeon, who also trained at UCLA, um, he, he has set up our, our neuroanatomy lab at the Cancer Institute. So we have, we have a, quite a sophisticated lab that has multiple stations that each station has essentially an operating room equipment, you know, portfolio there. So it's got microscope endoscopes, drills, micro instruments, and cadaver heads that we, we try different approaches on. And the fellows and the students work in that lab to, you know, learn. We have a lot of, um, we have clinical fellows that are, that are, you know, U.S. trained that are operating with this, but then we have a lot of um, international fellows. Like right now we have a fellow from Malaysia and we have one from the Philippines. And they, they can't operate because they don't have a California license. So they spend a lot of time in the lab after watching what we're doing in the operating room and then trying that in the, in the lab. So that's, a, that's another way to, to you know, introduce new techniques or learn new techniques. So you've mentioned uh, PNI or Pacific Neuroscience Institute a few times. Can you explain to us what the vision behind starting it was and what you guys do specifically? Yeah. So I was at UCLA for uh, 14 years on faculty. And I started as a junior faculty. I, when I left, I was a full professor. And, um, and I, st I started about thinking about going to UCLA, going to St. John's because of the, the John, what was at the time called the John Wayne Cancer Institute. And there was no neuro-oncology there. And there was an opportunity to create uh, essentially a brain tumor program there. So in 2007, I left. UCLA um, to do that and, and, and started, you know, and over time, we, we built up quite a busy practice. I, I brought in a junior partner, Dr. Barkadarian. My other partner is Chester Griffiths, who's an ENT and Howard Krauss is a neuro ophthalmologist. We started thinking, well, maybe we should create our own neuroscience institute because we're doing a lot of things that go beyond cancer. We're, you know, we're part of the cancer institute, but we do a lot of benign brain tumors. My partner is doing hydrocephalus work, facial pain work. We're developing a stroke program with some other doctors. So the idea of a neuroscience institute came, came to be. And we, we really formed that in 2015. We formed PNI then. We brought in a neuro-oncologist, Santosh Kayseri. And those were the four founders of the group. So myself, an ENT, a neuro-oncologist, and a neuro-ophthalmologist. And we formed PNI. And we, then we formed an alliance with Providence. You know, Providence Health is this very large Catholic health care system that has 51 hospitals up and down the West Coast, and St. John's is one of them. And so we formed what's basically an agreement with them, a professional service agreement um, to have PNI Medical Group um, as part of the Providence system. And so when we started back in 2017, when this was all kind of finalized, we had 17 doctors in the medical group. Now we have 36 and we'll probably be 40 docs 
in a in a in a few more months. And so we've grown a lot. We're a multi-specialty neuroscience group. So we have neurologists, neurosurgeons, neuro-oncologists, neuro-ophthalmologists, we have a bunch of ENTs, we have a bunch of stroke doctors, neurointerventionalists, we have a psychiatrist, geriatrician, addiction medicine specialist. And some of those people, and, and over time, we've developed new centers of excellence. So we have our pituitary center, our brain tumor center, but we also have hydrocephalus, facial pain. And the last center of excellence that we developed is the Pacific Brain Health Center. And that's the one where we um, focus on um, dementia, neurocognitive issues, and mood disorders. And that's where the, the psychedelics program um, emanated from, our TRIP program. That's run by Keith Heinzerling, who's an addiction medicine specialist. So, so basically, it's a PNI is a multi specialty group. We cover multiple hospitals, but we're based at St. John's and 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 a couple other hospitals in the Providence system, like Little Company of Mary. And we have all these different you know centers of excellence that do clinical care, but we also do a lot of um, research and clinical trials. This podcast is brought to you by Pacific Neuroscience Institute Foundation. It only takes one month to change the rest of your life. Prevent memory loss and preserve your brain health with PNIF's new lifestyle program, available virtually and in person. Limited spots are available. Find out more at pacificlifestyle.org. So like when I look at your career, it always seems like you're trying new things and pushing your yourself to not really stay in one, one place, but try new things. So what drives you to continue to develop in your career and also like just strive for excellence in whatever you do? Mm. Good question. Well, I think I'm, you know, fortunate enough to have found something that I really like doing. You know, I like the neuro, I love the neurosciences. Um, I love doing neurosurgery. Um, and I think, and I, I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. And like I said, you know, you, you have to sort of love the neuroanatomy. You have to like the challenge of surgery. Surgery for me is a lot like an athletic sport. You know, I think you have to be, um, you have to have some basic coordination and dexterity and um, anatomical, you know, skills. Um, and if you have all, if you have all that and you, you have, uh, some ability to have, you know, endurance as well, I think you can really enjoy being, being a surgeon. I happen to like other things as well. And I, and I like creating, creating things and creating functional, you know, organizations. So creating P, P and I has been a lot of fun, a lot of work, it's not, not easy, you know, working within big organizations is challenging. Like UCLA was a big, challenging organization, um, but a great, a great institution. And Providence is a, a big organization. And um, you know, you have to like working with people um, and and have people's best interest in mind. I think to be to be successful. Um, and you know, I think you know more recently, I. You know, I love my my work as a neurosurgeon, but over the last few years, creating the Brain Health Center and creating the TRIP program, our, our treatment and research in psychedelics, have been two of the most exciting things I've done. And I and 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 the reason why I've been you know passionate about it is that um, you know while the work in say in brain tumors is obviously really important, the, the magnitude of the problems within, you know, neurocognitive issues within dementia and anxiety, depression, addiction, PTSD are just enormous. You know, they dwarf the number of brain tumor patients, for example. So I see a, a big potential upside to be very involved in, um, in brain health in general and the psychedelic renaissance specifically. Uh, speaking of the trip program, we had a question about what patients you see the most success with, with that program or like what types of patients, especially. Right. Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, our program in this is pretty new. We just started in 2019 and we just finished our first two clinical trials and we don't really have publishable results yet because one, one was a study in alcoholics with psilocybin and the other was a major depression study 
um, with psilocybin as well. And that, that study is a multi-center phase two trial run by USONA Institute. And um, the results aren't in yet. I mean, we just enrolled the last, our last patient a, a month or so ago. <clears throat> so it'll take a while for the follow-up on those patients. But in general, um, let's just take depression, for example. So the, the trial is using psilocybin-assisted therapy. So one or two guided sessions of psilocybin with PrEP and what's called integration on either side of the, the journeys, the, the, the medicine journeys. Um, the success rate in alleviating depression um, or anxiety is around 60 to 70%, which is way higher than you know, standard therapy. Um, if you look at the addiction studies, you know, back in the fifties and sixties, they were using LSD a lot for alcoholism. Um, and we're going to, we're going to be doing an LSD study for anxiety. Um, so LSD is coming back and we'll see whether, how, how it compares to psilocybin, but the, Currently, the um, addiction studies with for alcoholism, small studies, and for nicotine, for cigarettes, um, again, it's around a 60 to 70 percent long term quit rate with a single guided session. So which is remarkable. If you think of Chantrix or the, any other smoking cessation programs, the success rate is around 20 to 30 percent at best. So this is probably at least, you know, an order of magnitude better. And, and it's a, just a completely different approach. You know, psychedelic assisted therapy is really um, this sort of psycho-spiritual journey with the added, you know, psychological counseling of trying pe to get people before they go on their, their journey or their trip, you know, for example, why are you smoking? You know, what are the issues around that? What do you want to accomplish and getting them this sense of fortitude for the journey? Cause the, the, the psychedelic experiences can be quite challenging and um, and it's meant to be because it's meant for people to dive deep into their issues to try and really understand why they're doing what they're doing. And, and this is the magic of psychedelics is very much de debated. Why does a single journey open someone up to, you know, these new epiphanies, these new, perspectives on why they're doing something or why they're depressed um, that lasts with them, allows them to basically readjust themselves, readjust their minds. And, um, and, and so, you know, I think that's the really interesting thing. We'll, we'll see where it goes, but I think, I do think this, that psychedelics is going to, is going to fundamentally transform behavioral health care and the neurosciences in, in the coming decade. So um, you mentioned that you're using psilocybin for both of those um, uh, trials. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if there's a reason why you're using psilocybin. I've heard of like ketamine being used before for some types of therapy. Um, so. Right. Well, so, um, <clears throat> you know, ketamine is an approved anesthetic agent, right? And it's been around for a long time and it works on the NMDA system. It for years, they, they used to sort of try to avoid the, quote, psychedelic effect of ketamine. But it, then it became apparent actually back in the 70s that with ketamine, with an intramuscular injection um, or other routes of administration, you could get a sort of psychedelic experience, often like an out-of-body experience. And they call it a dissociative anesthetic. So people sort of dissociate their, their heads and their minds from their body. And, but some of them can have very profound um, um, spiritual experiences on ketamine. Only lasts about an hour and a half. And in our clinic, Dr. Heinzerling, who runs our program, does ketamine assisted therapy because it's, it's legal. You know, it's an FDA approved drug now. Psilocybin, LSD, and MDMA are all in schedule one, meaning they're, you know, they've been banned. They, they quote, have no medical use, um, but, but, you know, that's all being re-looked at. And so with, if you want to do psilocybin treatment, it has to be under the auspices of a clinical trial. Same with LSD and MDMA. 
So there are many trials going on for psilocybin right now. And the reason why we, we tend to use, I think most groups like NYU, Johns Hopkins, um, Imperial College London, the, the big psychedelic group, for, they've been doing more psilocybin in part because um, psilocybin, the psilocybin journey is shorter. It's five to six hours with LSD. It's more like, you know, eight to 10 hours. It's a much longer period. So it makes the treatment model, the observation model much longer, more, more resources, that sort of thing. And there's still more of a sort of cultural uh, hangover from LSD from the sixties and seventies. I think people are a little bit, when they hear LSD, they, you know, they get a little bit concerned, but their LSD and psilocybin are very similar pharmacologically. They both work on the serotonin, their serotonin agonists predominantly, and they have very similar experiences. You know, they're very visual. They, people will often have a mystical experience or spiritual experience and really the only, the only real major difference is the duration. And then MDMA, which, you know, also known as ecstasy, MDMA also works on the serotonin system, but it also works on, on uh, other, you know, on norepinephrine, epinephrine. It also causes the release of oxytocin and cortisol. And it's also known as an empathogen and it's being mostly looked at for um, PTSD and actually MDMA is the furthest along of any schedule one drug. Now, you know, they're in phase three trials for PTSD. One has already been completed, hugely positive. And the second trial, the second phase three trial is more than I think 70% enrollment. And so there's a good chance MDMA will be approved for PTSD within the next year, year and a half for psilocybin. It's probably at least another three or four years down the road. Uh, another question, sorry, I have, I'm very interested by this stuff. Uh, um, I have a question about uh, people, you, I've heard of use of psychedelic therapies for people in terminal illness to deal with their grief. Do you ever integrate that in with your um, cancer patients from your neurosurgery? Yeah, well, so that is a great question. So we have a pilot trial for brain tumor patients that we've planned. We've, we're, we're hoping to actually do that before, to start that before the end of the year. You know, um, there have been a number of trials for end of life existential crisis with psilocybin uh, in cancer patients or other terminally ill patients with very good success. And um, and so we think it's um, we think it's a great target for grief. And we also think it's a great target for many of our brain tumor patients, even benign and malignant brain tumors. Um, the the issue has been that. Every clinical trial to date has um, excluded patients with brain tumors because they're worried that they could have a seizure uh, during their psilocybin experience. But our you know, review of the literature and review of the, the physiology of psilocybin, there's no evidence at all that it actually lowers the seizure threshold. So we think it will be quite safe and effective for brain tumor patients. And hopefully we're going we're gonna to prove that in a pilot trial coming up? It's a great question. Yeah. Uh, speaking more generally, just about being a doctor, I guess, <clears throat> what is a valuable character trait in a doctor that you have had to learn? Because um, I know that um, most people know that to become a doctor, you have to develop your knowledge and technical skills, but in terms of the character aspect, what has been like the most important character trait um, in becoming a doctor? You got to like taking care of people, obviously. Um, I think that you um, going, I mean, the sort of the fundamental concept I think that is so important is if this were your, if you're taking care of a patient, if this were your family member, how would you want them to be treated? You know, and, and you have to, you have to, you have to think about that um, uh, with every patient, you know, what's, what's best for the patient given their, their, their situation. Um, the other thing that I would say, particularly for the surgical specialties where you will have complications, 
is that you need to, goes back to a little bit what I was talking about, you really need to learn from that. And, you know, in neurosurgery, when we have complications, things can go really bad. I mean, people can, you know, they can have a stroke, they can lose their vision, they can develop double vision, um, they can lose cognition. I mean, there's all sorts of ways things can go um, not optimally. And I think having resilience in that, in when those events happen, but also learning from them and trying not to repeat history, learn from other mistakes and learn from your own mistakes. Um, I, I think that's um, a really critical trait, particularly if you go into one of the sort of higher risk surgical specialties. Um, and, and I, I do think, um, you know, and this wasn't hard for me, but I think it is hard for the, the, the need for sort of intellectual honesty, you know, where you, you kind of know if things didn't go well, you have to, you know, you gotta, you gotta really kind of go over that with yourself and talk to colleagues about it. Um, and, you know, because a lot of docs get, you know, there's, there's, um, there are high rates of mental health disorders within physicians. It's a stressful, it's a stressful career for, for many people. And, um, um, and I, I, I think that that, that sort of openness is critical. Yeah. So. How do you, take care of your mental health and overcome um, any mental or mental struggles um, that you face as a doctor? That's a great question too. Um, I think for me, um, I exercise quite a bit. I, I, I run not every day, but almost every day, um, usually with my dog and uh, off leash. And um, that's good for me. I meditate every morning. Um, I have a meditation practice that I've had now for probably six or seven years. Um, not, you know, and I would always like to do more, but I think, um, that's good. I, I read a lot. I listen to a lot of music, um, try to spend time with, with, um, my family. My daughters are grown now, but my, my wife, um, you know, I think having a good solid family life is, is very helpful. Um, but those are the, those are the the main things. I think, I think, um, exercise and some sort of contemplative practice, whether it's, you know, meditation or whatever, whatever people like it, I think is important. I think that's a really important, uh, um, thing to do to, to balance and give yourself some, you know, good perspective. Uh, speaking of maintaining balance and staying resilient, do you have any tips for undergraduates like us uh, as we like look forward into becoming physicians? Yeah, I think um, you know one of one of my my mentors, my my main mentor in neurosurgery, Ed Laws, he used to say, "The art is long," and um, I think you have to be patient and. Someone else said that, but he he quoted that. I think I can't remember who made that quote. The art is long. That you're you're always learning the art and the and the skill. And I think that um, you know when you're in in college, you have this entire world ahead of you and so many opportunities. And and you really, I think you need to expose yourself to as much as you can read a lot, listen to a lot of people, look at people, you know, like you're looking at me, people in their careers of what they're doing and, and how they're liking it. Um, and I, I think that, um, you know, at this point in your career, there, there's not necessarily any wrong decisions, you know, and ultimately you kind of have to go with your gut of what, what you're passionate about. And, and I think trying not to be intimidated you know, medicine is, is competitive. It's a, it's a competitive um, sport in some ways to get into medical school. Um, but I think perseverance, um, perseverance pays off. And it's really a great career. I mean, like I said, I, I went into medicine, to med school to kind of postpone a decision because I knew there would be something I would like. And sure enough, there was, you know, and um, it's a, it's a huge 
playground of intellectual and physical challenges that you can do for a career. You know, it's just, it's just this enormous space of, of, you know, professional career and, and, um, and it's a great education along the way. So even if you get all the way through med school and you decide to become a, you know, a writer or you be, become, you know, you want to go work for a pharmaceutical uh, or something like that, you know, you've, you've got that education behind you. So um, it wouldn't be wasted either way. All right. Well, thank you so much for all of your answers and for your uh, tidbits of wisdom here. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on to uh, speak with us today. All right, Hugo and Jacob, good talking to you guys. Good luck. 